Welcome to Face to Face. Our guest today is Susan Whitehead. She is the Vice Chair of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT, a life member of the MIT's Board of Trustees, Board Chair of Berkeley College of Music. On October 25th, she will be honored by AIF at their virtual gala. And we are very excited that uh, uh, Susan is getting this award from AIF, and we are going to talk to her today about how she got interested in India, her passion for art and culture, and everything else she does as well. So, Susan, welcome to our show, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Upendra. It's a delight to speak with you. Sure. And we, we are really excited that AIF is honoring you on October 25th. We are hoping to see you in person in March. But because of COVID, everything has moved now to the virtual. And uh, so let us start with, uh, I know you have a lot of passion for India and all. So how did you get interested in India and when was the first time you visited India? Well, it's, it's a bit of a story. Um, my mother and father were both passionate travelers mm -hmm. uh, and particularly liked uh, Southeast Asia. So I'd never had the privilege of visiting with them, but I certainly caught the bug from them. From them, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would bring home things, and of course we would speak. And then uh, the first time I went to India myself, it was in my early 20s. And um, I'd had the privilege of going to China when China mm -hmm. just opened up. Uh, which was quite extraordinary. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, I've always wanted to go to India. I'm so far away. I've taken all this time off of work. I'm going to India. So uh, at the time, it felt like I was hopping over to India. And I was meditating quite a bit at that point mm -hmm. in my life. And so I went to an ashram. And where was that ashram? Uh, it was in Patna. Patna, is, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in my early 20s. And then I've gone back many times since then for a great variety of reasons. It's mm -hmm. evolved over the course of the last four decades. Mm -hmm. And what are the other parts you have traveled in India? Pretty much everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I have not been to Benares yet. We were just mm -hmm. talking about Benares. And, mm -hmm. and I hope to do that. And I'd love to go to Baroda, where I've not been. Mm -hmm. But I've been from the very northernmost part to the very southernmost part. Mm -hmm. um, so what is that in India which you really like? Well, it's, if, it's, uh, I, I feel a little um, uh, funny saying this. But mm -hmm. It's pretty much everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like the people. I, I love the spirit of the people. I love how spirit and beauty are embedded in everything. Um, and it's a part of everyday life. It's incorporated into everything. I mean, that's quite un-American, actually. It's mm -hmm. a completely different sensibility. And I, I really love how the very ancient is incorporated into the very contemporary. And wherever you go, it's sort of ancient and new simultaneously, young and old. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a um, but it's really the beauty uh, in every form, from the statues to the colors. To, I, I find the people very beautiful in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, you know, beauty is embedded everywhere. And that just spoke to my soul and my spirit. I love how puja is embedded in everyday life. For right, yeah. Everyday. That's you start with that, end the day with that, sure. Yes, and I like how it's sort of all in. Um, and I like the presence of families hmm. and the importance of family. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, I pretty much like everything. What about food? <laughs> I love the food. So you have, do, go ahead. I have a funny story about it. Because, sure, tell us. You know, I like all the different cuisines, but I had not been to uh, Calcutta. Uh, since my very first trip over 40 years ago. And I had the pleasure of returning to Calcutta uh, in the last couple of years. And I, I spent about a week there and I just couldn't believe the food. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just fantastic, but it was like a cuisine I hadn't tasted for decades. And I loved it. 
Okay. Now, since you, you said that you like everything about India, uh, have you watched any Bollywood movie or? Yes, no? of course. Of course, okay. Of course. Do you remember the name of the movie or? Uh, well, I've seen a ton of them and I, I'm not uh, very good at names. Yeah, it's a difficult show. Oh, I yes. saw the uh, <laughs> recent one that made such a splash about uh, a set in Rajasthan. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, that was so controversial. And a friend of mine, actually somebody who's quite involved in AIF, Mm -hmm. uh, just sent me a list of movies that I have. Yeah. So, so actually, that was going to be my next question: is how did you get involved with the AIF, and how long you, how did you get involved with AIF? Well, I have a very dear friend, a woman named Lucy Aptekar, mm -hmm. uh, who's an art consultant and art curator, mm -hmm. uh, also one of my best friends, and she was doing a project uh, involving Tanjore painting. Mm -hmm from the south of India. Sure. And um, she and I would basically talk about it every day. And this was about 10 years ago. And she said to me one day, this is ridiculous. We talk about this every day. Why aren't we just working together on it? Mm -hmm. And so we started to work together on it. And at that point, she and I did uh, you know, everything Indian mm -hmm. uh, in the States. And so we got to know AIF. I, I'd known one of the founders of AIF. Mm -hmm. Uh, for quite some time, somebody who's involved in uh, MIT, Victor Menezes, who's a wonderful mm -hmm. human being. Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so we got to know AIF very well. And it completely- It's a great organization, sure. Great, you know what I love about it, Upendra? Mm. It was born out of a, a very serious disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Gujarat earthquakes. Yes. And and I loved how Bill Clinton mm -hmm. uh, spoke with his Indian friends and said, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was born out of a passion to, to address this horrible disaster and made possible by friendship and mm -hmm. a sort of passionate friendship. And, and it's just gone on from there. Um, and my whole life has been involved with the sorts of questions mm -hmm. Uh, and issues that AIF is involved with. So it completely resonates for me. It, it did from day one. Okay. Now, also I need to ask you is, uh, I'm very much familiar with uh, uh, Whitehead uh, Institute and what a wonderful role it plays in uh, biomedical research uh, in, in not only in the United States, but worldwide. How has been uh, uh, your uh, take and experience of the Institute, how the Institute has been? Uh -huh. Well, it, that was a great privilege of my life, quite honestly. Sure. You know, this was my father's passion mm -hmm. uh, and he founded it. And what it, uh, it's done wonderful things in the world. Mm -hmm. it sure. question, but it's done wonderful things in my life. Sure because it opened up the whole arena of the most significant biological research that, it, that sure. in the end addresses human health and, and the betterment for human beings. Um, but it's also opened up for me, the whole world of MIT mm -hmm. and the absolute wonder of that institution and the gift that MIT is to the world. And so, you know, I, I just feel remarkably privileged. Okay. So now I want to move from science and technology aspect of your life to uh, music. Uh, how did you get involved with the Berkeley College of Music? Uh, I got involved because, you know, who doesn't love music, right? Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's an easy one. And then one of my closest friends became the president um, of the college about 17 years ago, a wonderful leader named Roger Brown. Mm -hmm. And when he became president, he said to a bunch of us, uh, to me and two other friends, uh, you have to come, mm -hmm. you have to help me out here. So we, and of course, we said yes. I mean, who would say no to that? Sure, sure. Uh, and that was the beginning of, of that relationship. But, you know, what a time to be involved in global music. Sure. Uh, over the past 17 years. I mean, it's been a fantastic journey and technology and music over the past 17 years and online music education and Berkeley excels at it. Yeah. Um, so it's been a very splendid ride. 
And Berkeley also has a great program uh, and the teachers about the Indian music, you know, our different type of uh, Indian music. And uh, uh, they have attracted really some of the greatest uh, musicians from India at Berkeley from time to time. Absolutely. Because, oh, yeah. we've, we've had wonderful guest artists. Sakir Hussain came last year. Right. Uh, and, and there's a whole list of people who sure, sure, sure. were terrific. And the leadership of that group under Annette Phillips. Yes, yes, yes. It's fantastic. She's actually playing at the AIF Gala. Oh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, 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 she does this type of performance at many charity events, so that's really great. And yes, yes. So now, um, I also wanted to touch base a little bit about the art, since you are very much involved, you mentioned the Tandoor paintings, uh, is how the world of art had changed, your museums especially had changed in, in, in the light of uh, technology and especially now pandemic, because um, of course the audience is able to see a lot of things through internet and all, but there's a complete decline in terms of uh, revenue for the museums and because there are hardly any visitors and all. So just give us your take on, on the technology and, and the museums and art. Right. Well, I think, I mean, you raise, you know, a very essential question about the business model of museums and that's sure. completely unclear mm -hmm. uh, what that will look like in the future. But in terms of access to museums and mm -hmm. seeing museums as something that uh, they're institutions for all people, and they can touch all people and should be touching all people and reaching all people. It's been utterly fantastic over the past decade. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been following quite closely the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore mm -hmm. and founding and it, it's been involved since its origins. And what they are doing with technology is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the advent of augmented reality, virtual reality, is going to be embedded in that whole experience. Mm -hmm. we, haven't, we haven't quite crossed that, mm -hmm. yet, but we're close, and, and that's on the horizon. But MAP, Museum of Art and Photography, right now is doing a lot with holograms and digitizing their collection making it possible to look at objects in the collection mm -hmm. from 360 degree angles. Uh, you know, it's, it's alive, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the verge of, we're, we're entering a very exciting stage and I don't think it's entirely clear, you know, what the end points will be or the waypoints will be, sure. but what a journey this is. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, this pandemic has also changed the people's uh, uh, lifestyle, the thinking process and technology, and people are trying to, to figure it out. How has uh, the pandemic affected your work or your passion? Uh, well, it's, it's been sort of a funny mix. You know, I, I, um, I think we all have completely different experiences of this. Sure. It depends whether you're rich or you're poor. Mm -hmm. Whether you're in a city or you're in the country, right? Mm -hmm. Depends whether you have children at home or you have vulnerable people at home. So I, I don't have children at home, mm -hmm. grown up. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been a time that, you know, has been, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say it is sort of a gift to me mm -hmm. of a little time to myself, not running around all mm -hmm. the time. And so I can do things like go to a lot of webinars. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, and look at things and study things that I've wanted to forever, but they don't quite fit in so well in the in the ordinary life. And it's sure. also it's a desperate time in the it's it's a desperate and painful, anxious time in the world. Yeah, yeah. So, you know that that mixes in as well, and AIF is involved with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually I had a during this whole pandemic you know I'm a big gardener I just spend you know if I can spend my entire life 24 7 I'll be just doing the gardening so this time for the first time in 2025 20, years I got dedicated fully myself to gardening and what an amazing experience I had really it I was just so happy for you I did a little of that too yeah okay and yeah. It's, 
It's fabulous. I mean, when have you ever been able to weed when you needed to weed and water whenever you needed to? Right, water? right. yeah, exactly. And watch everything unfold. Sure, yeah. You know, and my, this tiny piece of, uh, uh, you know, the vegetable garden, for the entire summer, it fed four families. I'm not kidding. There is always something and always, you know, it was, that way it was a good experience. Of course, it has, you know, a lot of other, you know, impact on business and other things like right. that. But, uh, but that's okay. I think, you know, hopefully we'll come out of this soon. Uh, uh, another topic I want to touch base with you is um, uh, STEM, you know, the, the role of um, uh, the women. Uh, how do you look at them? Because since you, are, you deal with uh, various spectrum of, you know, science and technology and music and art and culture, right. uh, how, how do you look, how do you look at the, say, if I ask you to look and tell me about, uh, you know, the um, role of uh, women or females for the next five, 10 years, how important role they are going to play? Right. So I, I think clear, I, I think it varies tremendously mm -hmm. where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the States, right at the moment, I mean, this is the top, one of the major topics of our time, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And I was speaking with a young woman um, last week who said something that was so basic and mm -hmm. so profound to me. Um, she, her name is Danielle. Uh, she's at MIT and she said, you know, in your generation, meaning me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in your generation, you were just consumed with getting people in the room. Uh, and she said, for my generation, Gen Z, uh, we're consumed with what happens to you once you're in the room. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was just such a simple, direct, great reframe. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it I, I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds absolutely right to me. I think it's an enormously complex question, and, and that's where we are. I mean, we're, you know, it, I, I, I've always felt with any kind of social movement or social change of a fundamental nature in a culture, you know, you, you pick the, the low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. the obvious, uh, and you address that really frontally. And I think that, you know, we've gone through, we're, we have gone through and are still going through that stage. And now it's a little more complex and subtle mm -hmm. uh, with what happens to you when you're in, when you're in that room. And so I, th I think that we're going to continue to make progress. Uh, I, I know we will. And this generation mm -hmm. is very dedicated to that progress. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way that's quite different from our generation, feels different. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, it feels yeah. much more real and essential to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, it's essential. You know, women have as much and more. Yes. Uh, and also, you know, they are very uh, clear headed, they have a lot of passion. Actually, I, I'm, maybe I'm, I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Is, uh, during these uh, primary elections, my daughter sees, you know, this is her the last year in high school. She, just in five minutes, she was able to change my mind, for whom should I vote? Very clear, this is what exactly she wants, this is what is exactly happening in the world. Right. And then I asked her, and she said the same thing, you know, her friends are doing the same thing. They're talking to their parents and all this stuff. So we have a very, exciting um, generation coming up who is very much passionate about what is happening around us and in the world. And, and, and it seems that future looks really good. We will hit some bumps here and there, but I think uh, uh, now uh, coming back to you, um, you mentioned earlier that you, uh, that you. Good for you, congratulate your daughter. That's oh, thank powerful. you, thank you. So you said that, you know, your parents had a you know, tremendous impact on you in terms of, you know, when it came to traveling and all. Did you travel with them any, to India with them or no? Never. And I really regret that I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm just really sorry that we didn't do that. You know, again, it was a very different era. Sure. And when they were traveling, um, I was mostly in high school and then I was off building my own career as a young lawyer. But mm. um, 
I regret that we didn't do that together because that, that is the part of the world that resonated for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they were most excited about. Wouldn't that have been wonderful to share it with them? Yeah, yeah. Did they, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, did they tell you any story about India or any, any, any good travel story which impacted you? Uh, not that I can recall. I just recall the feeling. Okay. Uh, and the excitement. And I do remember when my mother uh, had traveled a trip to Pakistan mm -hmm. and she came back and talked about the beauty mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I'll never forget. I mean, it was, she, she felt transformed and elevated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't get over the beauty that she had, had witnessed and, and lived within. Mm -hmm. uh, and wouldn't that have been great to see with her? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you know, sometimes as we age, we always go back to to the childhood and see, you know, where we are. And finally we realize, oh my God, I wish we had done this, we had done that, you know. But uh, uh, anyway, what about um, uh, your children? Are they are, um, uh, explorers like you or? Yes, yes. I, as uh, I, I think I mentioned to you, my son's a journalist and he was yes. overseas. Sure. And mm -hmm. so, um, yes, I have dragged my son and his wife to India, uh, and they went very willingly, and that was a fantastic trip, and I'm so happy we did it. Okay. Uh, now, as we come close to our interview, uh, I just want you to tell us one interesting story about your experience in India. Oh, my goodness. I know you must have plenty, but just one, oh one insight. Oh, my goodness. Well, I guess, um, oh, I should talk about because it was, it's so, such a strange concept for Americans. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I went uh, for Diwali mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. I've always wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And finally, a very good friend who lives in Chennai said to me, oh, this is ridiculous. You need to just come already. Drop what you're doing and, and come, you know, stay with my family, I know his whole family. Mm -hmm. So um, I went and you know, <laughs> it was wild. Mm -hmm. So we cooked for days and days. Right, and, yeah, you know, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we cooked with staff in their household, which is something mm -hmm. that Americans are not accustomed to. Mm -hmm, sure. uh, and you know, it's a luxurious way to cook quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, celebrating Diwali. So. Uh, so priests came to the house. Uh, mm -hmm. We, on their granite floor, we created fires and incense and smoke and song and some dance. And we did this for hours and hours together and neighbors wander in and out. I mean, this is, this is nothing like Americans ever experience sure. mm -hmm. at all, at all. I, um, I remember, uh, you know, very interesting joke somebody said many, many years ago that an uh, American atheist who never believed in God uh, went to India. And then when he came back after spending a few months there, his parents asked him, he became a staunch believer in God and religion. And his parents asked him that, what made you change? He said, after I went to India, I saw that nobody works and it's still country runs it smoothly. So there has to be a God to make it run. <laughs> <laughs> make this possible. <laughs> make, make this possible. So, yeah. so it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a good, it's a amazing, you know, either when you go to India, either you really like it or you just hate it, you know. So I'm glad that you yeah. are in the category of who really loves India. And um, uh, we will, uh, we are looking forward to seeing you on uh, virtually on October 25th for AIF. Now, before I let you go, uh, I just have to ask you, what do you think of the AIF uh, today, what AIF is doing? Oh, AIF is an amazing organization. I, I, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, you know, born out of, out of passion and deep caring and friendship. And AIF has gone on to evolve into a global, significant organization that helps millions of people. And they're, you know, in COVID, they, they have the capacity 
uh, to organize and rally very quickly and do real work on the ground. I, I, I love that they're totally on the ground. Yes. And that they um, also are a training group. Yes. Uh, and, you know, it's, um, they're very effective at it and they're very well run organization. So I'm of the generation where people did lots of good in lots of places and it didn't have much staying power. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I admire and respect AIF for its staying power. Right. Suzanne, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure talking to you. And we will see you virtually on uh, doing the AIF gala on October 25th. Well, Pedro, thank you so much. It was a sure. delight to speak with you. Sure, same thing, yeah. Thank you. Thanks.